West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. So we have some bad legal news for a top Trump associate, but first, just a reminder for the viewers that Glenn and I are doing comprehensive coverage, daily coverage of the Trump trial happening right now in Manhattan. So if you want to follow along with our coverage, please make sure to subscribe. All right, Glenn, let's talk about Donald Trump's top associate. What just happened at the Supreme Court? So, Brian, Peter Navarro just won't take no for an answer. This is the third time he's asked the Supreme Court to either keep him out of prison or, once he was there, get him out of prison. Our viewers will recall he was convicted of two counts of contempt of Congress for violating two congressional subpoenas, one for testimony and one for documents. Why? Because he didn't want to testify to the January 6th House Select Committee about the crimes of Donald Trump. This really was his attempt to bury incriminating evidence against Donald Trump. He was willing to commit crimes, contempt of Congress. He went to trial. He got convicted. I mean, hands down, the jury barely had time for a lunch break when they went out to deliberate before they convicted him of both counts. And he was sentenced to four months in prison and a $9,500 fine. He immediately beat feet to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals trying to stay out of prison pending appeal. They said, um, no, because you don't have a winning claim on appeal as far as we're concerned. We're concerned right before he went in, he asked the Supreme Court to put a stop to his confinement. They denied it. He asked again, and it was referred to the full court. It was denied without dissent. And he just asked one more time, because as I say, he won't take no for an answer. And the court, again, the Supreme Court refused to take him, take it up, refused to grant him any relief. So now Peter Navarro will have to finish out his four month sentence and then he will be able to file his appeal. Glenn, what would be the rationale to actually release him from prison pending appeal be other than just, you know, I'm, I'm special because I'm a Republican? Yeah, there there really is no basis. Ordinarily, um, when somebody is convicted and they are sentenced, if they're sentenced to confinement, their sentence of incarceration begins on the day they're sentenced or shortly thereafter, if the judge gives them a grace period to get their affairs in order, something that people of privilege often get. But you know, the the lower level criminals, the folks without money, without connections, without influence, without friends in high places, they usually go right to jail the day they are sentenced. So um, the reason that uh, a defendant might be able to avoid prison pending appeal is twofold. One, if that person applies to the appeals court and can convince the appeals court that he has a, a high likelihood of success on appeal, because maybe there was a really meritorious issue that the judge got wrong in the trial court and maybe he will win on appeal. If he can persuade an appellate court of that, then they might not order him into confinement. They might intervene and leave him on release pending appeal. But as I said, Peter Navarro tried that and it didn't work. Why? 
because he didn't have a winning case uh, in the trial court, and he's not going to have a winning case on appeal. Okay, well, why was Steve Bannon able to successfully avoid serving his prison sentence pending appeal, given that these guys both committed the exact same crime of contempt of Congress? Does that mean that Steve Bannon has a higher likelihood of, of having this thing overturned on appeal? Brian, what a difference a judge makes. Because yeah. as you say, Steve Bannon was convicted of identical crimes. Two counts of contempt of Congress for violating two subpoenas, one for testimony, one for documents, because Steve Bannon also wanted to hide um, deeply incriminating information about Donald Trump. So he thumbed his nose at Congress. He went to trial. He was convicted. He also had no defense. And Brian, he has no hope, in my opinion, of winning any relief on appeal. But who was his judge? Trump appointee Carl Nichols, who did Steve Bannon an enormous favor, though, by letting him stay out and about and continue to sow dissension, continue to try to kill our democracy, you know, with his podcast and, and in other ways. And the, the difference is it was a Trump appointee on Bannon's case, but it was a fair, impartial, independent judge, Amit Mehta, on Peter Navarro's case. He assessed everything without fear or favor and without regard to politics or who appointed him. And he said, no, Peter Navarro, you're going to report to the Federal Bureau of Prisons and you're going to serve your four month term while you file your appeal. What a difference a judge makes. Glenn, is there any recourse when you have judges who don't really abide by the law with their rulings? Like, you have two identical rulings here. One person is just a Donald Trump appointee who did a favor, though, to, uh, to, to Steve Bannon. And then you have another one who ruled correctly. And so what recourse is there against these judges who otherwise have lifetime positions on the bench? Well, in the first instance, the prosecutors will oppose the request from a guy like Bannon to stay out pending appeal. Why? because he doesn't have a meritorious issue. Um, then if um, the trial court judge, as Carl Nichols did, rules against the government and does this favor for Steve Bannon, lets him stay out pending appeal, uh, I think technically it might be an appealable issue to the DC Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. I'd wanna check the court rules and the law on that because not many issues are appealable by the government, the prosecutors, most issues are appealable by a defendant. Um, but even if it was sort of open for an appeal, I'm sure the prosecutors made the assessment that they would have such a heavy lift reversing Carl Nichols' decision to leave Bannon out pending appeal that it wasn't worth filing. Um, so they did not take it up. They did not contest it. But um, I'll tell you, there have been there's been a lot of grumblings in D.C. criminal justice circles. You know, D.C. is a big city, but a very small community when it comes to practitioners in the D.C. criminal justice system, which was where I practiced for nearly a quarter of a century. And uh, people thought it was supremely unfair. Many of the folks I've talked to, not all of them, that, you know, Bannon would get to be footloose and fancy free pending an appeal, which has little hope of succeeding. Yet Navarro goes to prison and serves his four months as well he should. Um, and that kind of unequal application of the laws and preferential treatment, depending on which president appointed which judge to the federal bench, is something that I think we need to work hard every day to try to stamp out. Now, more broadly, is there any recourse in terms of like, what happens to this judge? Does he just continue to hang on to his lifetime position no matter how much he abuses it? Is there any process if you have a judge in the mold of Carl Nichols or Aileen Cannon that you can do something about it? Or is that just, you know, the that's that's how uh, that's how the cookie crumbles basically that's how, that's what i was thinking of that's how the the judicial cookie crumbles yeah. um so you know there is some recourse for example anybody who wants to file a complaint against the judge for misconduct can go to uscourts.gov there is an easy to fill out one and a half page form and you can file a judicial complaint. I think lots of those have been flooding in, for example, based on, on what Judge Aileen Cannon has been doing, giving preferential treatment to Donald Trump in his federal prosecution down in Florida. I have a feeling a fair number have probably been filed uh, concerning Judge Carl Nichols. 
Um, you know, I, and I would never discourage people from doing it because trying to make your voice heard in our government, even when it seems to be futile, like calling your elected representatives in a deeply red state and, you know, urging them to apply the law equally or interpret the Constitution, you know, in a legitimate way, often falls on deaf ears. So that's one thing that people can do. Um, the other thing, of course, is a judge can be impeached for misconduct. I haven't seen sort of an appetite in Congress to even take on some more egregious examples of judicial misconduct, like uh, by people, um, the uh, Supreme Court justices like Alito or Clarence Thomas, who have violated our nation's financial disclosure laws, federal laws requiring them to disclose these in-kind contributions by Republican billionaire donors. In-kind contributions is in my interpretation of the money that they've been taking in the lavish gifts and trips and accommodations and mobile homes that they have enjoyed, you know, on the dime of Republican billionaire donors. So I don't see an appetite in Congress for taking up difficult issues involving judicial misconduct. However, in theory, judges can be impeached for misconduct. And then at the end of it all, if there is a hint of criminal conduct, the Department of Justice could open a criminal investigation if they believe they had enough evidence. The magic words are adequate predication, enough evidence that there is some criminal activity going on. Do I see any of those possible approaches and remedies to, you know, taking on some of these Trump appointed judges or some of these justices who seem to be engaging in misconduct in the harsh light of day? I don't see any indication that any of these vehicles are going to be deployed anytime soon. Yeah, I think you're uh, I think you're right on that. Uh, let's finish off with this. Glenn, do you think that the fact that Navarro is in prison, um, that it's going to have any impact whatsoever on the next tranche of Trump acolytes seeking to break the law on his behalf? I think it extremely unlikely. Brian, you know, I'm always looking for that silver lining lurking behind the big, dark orange cloud that has hovered over us for some seven or eight years now. Um, here is something, and I, I hate to sort of end on a, on a down note, but Peter Navarro and Steve Bannon were prosecuted not for their participation in the insurrection, all things January 6th, but for defying congressional subpoenas. Who are the victims of those crimes? Congress. Congress's subpoena power was violated, and in a very real sense, Congress is the victims. Well, guess what? We the people were victims of many of the crimes of Navarro, Bannon, and so many others in Trump's orbit, and yet none of them have been held accountable, not even one minute for the January 6 crimes that many of them seem to have committed. That seems to be a real affront to we the people, to the American voters. And let's hope that somewhere on the horizon, you know, the, the Bannons and the Navarros and the Stones and others will be prosecuted, um, not just for defying congressional subpoenas, but for the crimes they committed against our very democracy and against the American voters. And I would just note, this is why we do this. This is why we have those conversations. This is why we continue beating this drum, because just because something isn't happening doesn't mean we should let them get away with it or not talk about it. This is why we're trying to get this exact thing into the to the body, body politic or, or into the media ecosystem. Like, that's why we continue to do this. That's why we'll continue to. And, you know, it may not, it may not work nine times out of ten, but if one time out of ten, you know, we have some success in getting people to talk about something, then it will have been worth it. So I think that's that's the whole point of kind of, you know, why we're doing what we do. It's it's not to lose faith in the entire system because, you know, we, we can't control everything. But if we can help by virtue of having these discussions, by virtue of getting this stuff, this good information out there, then I think it's worth doing. Yeah, Brian, I'm so glad you made that point because we are at this every day. And I know we're not screaming into the void. We have viewers who take to heart our, our analysis of the legal issues of the day and how dire some of these circumstances are. But, you know, I've always said justice is not a sprint. Justice is not even a marathon. It's not a race we are running. It's a lifelong quest. And I will be, you know, fighting for it, equal justice, equal application of the laws, a rational interpretation of the Constitution, one that doesn't, you know, revoke women's constitutional privacy rights. We're going to be fighting for it up to and including with our last breath. And then 
we'll turn it over to our kids and they will fight for it. Our grandkids will fight for it. It's neither a sprint nor a marathon. It is a lifelong quest, but I do believe we've come a long way. One of my favorite sayings is Martin Luther King Jr.'s The Ark of the Moral Universe is long, but surely it bends toward justice, and it does. Unfortunately, there's a kink in the ark, and it's our job to straighten it out and keep it bending toward justice. But, you know, there is no winning the justice battle. There is only fighting the justice battle eternally and better than the folks who are fighting to, you know, to delay justice, to avoid justice, to kill justice. And so I'm glad you made that point at the end of the video. It is Tuesday, the 30th of April of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the little Yorkie is our door girl, and she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. It always has, and it always will. Okay, I got that out. Well, you, you know, when you make these taglines and all these, like, little inside jokes, you never know when you might have to, to recite them, uh, you know, when it's not so jocular environment. So, as you know, I'm still in a quite morose period, so I apologize, but uh, I don't know. I'm just, I guess I'm trying to avoid it. And these small little snippets of time that I can etch out where... I have something other to do than, I don't know, revel, <laughs> whatever. No, there's all sorts of things that come to mind. You know, intellectually, we can go through life and we know all the things that we should be doing, that we should do, and that we should or will do. And then in the moment, you realize how far deficient you have been in achieving that. We know it. Can we do it? So, I guess there's some solace in the knowledge that you can't do everything. Because, you know, we are just, after all, mere humans. Hopefully. So, uh, I guess the the epiphany that comes out of moments like this is I'm not alone. I've heard it before. It's just that now I suppose I have a more visceral understanding, a more bodily understanding. And that is, there's never enough time. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not talking about just gross procrastination. I'm just saying, like, we'll do it tomorrow. Do it now. There's never enough time. Uh, just little things that make more sense now that in the moment when they were happening, I put a different spin, a different meaning upon it, predicated upon my wishes, my prejudices, my selfishness with this idea is that, hey, we have time. We never have enough time. One of the keys I saw in Mom's Decline, that I also put a different spin to because I didn't want to supposedly, I guess, not deal with it at the time, was that uh, she became a lot more compliant because my mom was a pretty formidable figure. Some might say argumentative. But um, I think she had a, uh, you know, an, an idea of what the truth is. And if she sensed something that was untruthful, uh, it, it raised her hackles. Let's just say that. So... Um, when she didn't sort of push back on certain things that I expected her to, I just sort of noticed it. So she'd be napping at times and, you know, like a neighbor would call or, you know, 
business people doing business for her and her, you know, her thing that she's become friends with over the decades call and say, yeah, I'm just checking in. How is she? You know, and that's not as if they don't ever call. I'm just, you know, and then I told her, so I want to talk to, I want to talk to them. I go, okay, well, uh, we'll get a hold of them right soon, you know? So I didn't want to disturb her nap. We'll get back to you. But instead of doing it immediately, he gets put off. There's never enough time. So then the patented, patented common feeling of guilt that envelops one in their moments of grief. Intellectually, I know it's going to happen. I know how to deal with it, but... I, <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm confessing right now. I guess it's the Catholic in me. You know, you get in and you can never get out. Damn Italians. Jesus. Roman Catholic. Jeez. You know, they taught us Latin and Greek back in the day in Catholic school. Had a choice. Two paths in the woods... I went to Rome. Okay. Anyway, uh, so I appreciate folks bearing with me. Those of you who have known uh, the Netroots Radio for some time went through this. Uh, wow, you know, this is the other thing. Time flies. What is time? Six years since my son passed. And I still feel that as if it was, I, I can't believe it's been that long already. It just, I've got to tell you, I'm still raw. Not as raw as I was. With mom, it's sort of expected because of her, her age and, you know, her physical condition. She lived a pretty hard life early on. And I guess later, but she 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 was a survivor and a fighter. So, uh, you know, it's the natural order of things when it's your parent, right? Still feel sad because you want to give your parent when you've made the promise to give them a quality of life. But you think there's always a left time. There's never enough time so that's my great lesson I'm sure you've heard it before but when it happens just know that there's never enough time do it now okay okay so uh, I suppose what I should do is get right on into what I have in store for you I I thought we did the royal we here well Sometimes we fall astray in our moments of woe. But uh, why don't I go ahead and give you a rundown on what we have in store for you here as we begin in the Bistro Cafe of this salon that we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And I guess the chef's table is between the cafe and the speakeasy. Okay. Can you see it? Well, at the top, yeah, you know, Peter Navarro, he does not take no for an answer. And we know that. Yep. Three swings and you're out. Especially when you miss. Three strikes. Well, I guess he's going to sit and stir because someone's got to take the heat as the whipping boy. Donald Trump's not going to serve any time. He's going to have his whipping boy serve the time. What does a king get? When they are king. Whipping boys to serve their prison time for the crimes they've committed. Come on. Supreme Court's going to rule that way. We're going to turn into Torquemondo at some point. What is that? I don't know. Okay. On the rest of the menu, Mississippi lawmakers are expected to vote on their Medicaid expansion plan with a work requirement. Going to make my 86, soon to be 87 year old mom go to work in the days before her demise. Give me a break. 
Okay. The family of a black teen who was shot after ringing the wrong doorbell has filed a lawsuit against the Kansas City, Missouri homeowner. Now, he's also under a criminal indictment. But, hey, add some heat. Might as well attack his homeowner's insurance. I think he's covered. And a former NSA worker gets nearly 22 years in prison for selling secrets to an undercover FBI agent he thought was a Russian official. Okay, I'm telling you, Vlad has declared war on us. What is it when you collude with the enemy? Just saying. After the break, we move to the chef's table, speaking of which where Belarus banned German state broadcaster Deutsche Welle as an extremist organization. Belarus within the Vlad Satellite Organizations. And in another tie-in with Vlad, a German army captain with ties to the far-right AFD party admitted to spying for Russia and leaking state secrets. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. do at this time and just tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And it comes out of the Associated Press by Emily Waxter Pettis. Mississippi lawmakers are expected to vote this week on a proposal that would expand Medicaid coverage to tens of thousands more people, but it includes a work requirement that might not win federal approval. Oh, how nice. The State House and Senate passed separate expansion plans earlier this year, with the four-month legislative session pushing into its final days. Negotiators from the two chambers submitted a compromise moments before a Monday night deadline last night. They declined to answer questions after emerging from a closed-door meeting, but the proposal was filled in, or was filed in the legislative clerk's offices. The plan would require the new Medicaid recipients to be employed at least 100 hours a month in a job that does not provide private health insurance. Or they could fit into other categories, such as being a full-time student or the parent of a child younger than six. If the federal government rejects Mississippi's work requirement, the State Division of Medicaid would be required to consider continue seeking approval each year, an acknowledgement that a different federal administration might provide a different decision.
Finger Hut of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. The family of a black teenager who was shot by a white homeowner when he mistakenly went to the wrong Kansas City, Missouri address filed a lawsuit yesterday, Monday, described by the family's attorney as an attempt to put pressure on the criminal trial later this year. The complaint, filed by Cleo Nagabi on behalf of her son, Ralph Yarl, alleges that Andrew Lester, age 84, was negligent when he shot the 16-year-old without warning more than a year ago on April 13. He states that Yarl suffered and sustained permanent injuries as well as pain and suffering as a direct result of Lester's actions. Lee Merritt, the family's attorney, said the civil suit is to give the family a chance to be in the driver's seat and pursuing justice for Ralph as the state's criminal case against Lester unfolds. Lester pleaded not guilty in September of 2023. The trial was scheduled to begin more than a year later on October 7th of 2024. Lester's attorney in the criminal case, Steve Salmon, said he is evaluating the civil complaint and will discuss it later with Lester. He said at a preliminary hearing for the criminal case that Lester was acting in self-defense, terrified by the stranger who knocked on his door as he settled in to bed for the night. A hulking black man is at my door. I got to shoot them. Jarl mixed up the street name of the house where he was sent to pick up his siblings. Jarl testified at the hearing that he rang the doorbell and then reached for the storm door as Lester opened the inner door. Lester told him, don't come here ever again, Jarl recalled. He said he was shot in the head, the impact knocking him to the ground, and was then shot in the arm as Lester stood over us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A former National Security Agency employee who sold classified information to an undercover FBI agent he believed to be a Russian official was sentenced yesterday Monday to nearly 22 years in prison, the penalty requested by government prosecutors. U.S. District Judge Raymond Moore said he could have put Jera Sebastian Dahlke, age 32, behind bars for even longer, calling the 262-month sentence mercy for what he saw as a calculated action to take the job at the NSA in order to be able to sell national security secrets. What if a guy ran for president to do the same thing, huh? Dalkey's attorney had asked for the Army veteran who pleaded guilty to espionage charges last fall in a deal with prosecutors to be sentenced to a mere 14 years in prison, in part because the information he sold in 2022 did not end up in enemy hands and cause damage. Assistant Federal Public Defender David Kraut also argued for a lighter sentence because he said Dalkey had suffered a traumatic brain injury and attempted suicide four times, had experienced traumas as a child, including witnessing domestic violence and substance abuse. Research has shown that kind of behavior trauma increases the risk of people later engaging in dangerous behavior. Well, usually people go rock climbing. You don't go selling secrets to our enemies. But hey, that's just me. 
Later, Donkey, who said he was remorseful and ashamed, told Moore he had also suffered PTSD, bipolar disorder, and obsessive-compulsive disorder. Is there anything left that this guy doesn't have? Bone spurs. He should have said he had bone spurs. He denied being motivated by ideology or earning money by agreeing to sell the secrets. Donkey also suggested he had an idea that he was actually communicating with law enforcement but was attracted to the thrill of what he was doing. Moore said he was skeptical of Donkey's claims about his conditions. And uh, since the defense did not provide any expert opinions or hospital records. Well, according to the documents, this little traitor who worked at the NSA for about a month told the undercover agent that he wanted to cause change after questioning the U, the United States' role in causing damage to the world. But he also said he was 237000 bucks in debt. He also said he had decided to work with Russia because his heritage ties back to your country. <laughs> okay, they always project, don't they? They think that we're all like this guy. And when I say they, I mean MAGA. This guy's going to get a pardon, and you know it. We can't let you-know-who prevail. Or his movement, it doesn't stop with that guy. All right, but you know what does stop? This part of the show, because we're going to go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Hi, this is Your Health Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. We bring you the latest vital health news, discoveries that affect your body and your mind. And we break down the medical research to help you stay healthy. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. We're Scientific American's senior health editors. Today we are talking about flu, but not just any flu. This is avian influenza or bird flu. It's been sickening wild birds and mammals around the world, and it has infected people. Now it's spreading among U.S. cows. But how big a threat is it to humans? Bird flu may sound like an innocuous disease that gives sparrows the sniffles, But it's actually quite a serious pathogen that infects farmed birds like chickens and many species of wild birds. It can also infect other animals and humans too, and sometimes it can be deadly. There are a couple of different kinds of bird flu. The one scientists are watching carefully right now is called highly pathogenic avian influenza A, or H5N1. In several bird flu outbreaks, the virus has spilled over into people who had close contact with the birds. It's had a very high mortality rate in those people. By high, that can mean around 50%. There was an H5N1 outbreak in Hong Kong in 1997 that sickened 18 people, six of whom died. It later infected more than 800 people, and more than half of those folks died. Yikes. Yeah, scary. The virus appeared again in China and several other countries in 2003. Another form of the virus caused deadly outbreaks around 2015 in Egypt and several countries in Asia. Yeah, it was pretty serious. This latest version of the virus is called H5N1 clade 2.3.4.4b. It started circulating around 2021 and soon spread throughout domestic and wild birds around the world, killing hundreds of millions of them. We've been watching this avian influenza H5N1 sublineage for a while because it has had many sort of unprecedented tactics that we haven't really seen before. That's Christine Kreuter Johnson, professor of epidemiology and ecosystem health and director of the Epicenter for Disease Dynamics at the University of California, Davis. Christine tracks zoonotic pathogens, that is, viruses or other infections that can jump between wild or domestic animals and humans. 
She was part of a pandemic warning project called PREDICT, funded by the United States Agency for International Development. The Trump administration shut that project down in March of 2020. Christine is a big advocate for One Health, an approach to understanding disease outbreaks that considers how the health of people, animals, and the environment are connected. The epidemic trajectory in Latin America even further emphasized how unusual this virus strain is in terms of its epidemiology. Suddenly, you had unprecedented cases of bird flu in marine mammals, including seals and sea lions. That really, for those of us who work in the wildlife health realm, was a major signal that this virus is continuing to change and further evolve. Because of that ongoing evolution, H5N1 has made leaps into a wide variety of mammal species, including not just marine mammals, but land-based ones, like foxes and bears and cats and dogs. Most recently, H5N1 has been detected in nearly 30 cattle herds spread across eight states. Those states are Texas, New Mexico, Kansas, Michigan, Idaho, South Dakota, North Carolina, and Ohio. In early April, H5N1 was reported in a person in the U.S., a dairy worker who likely had contact with infected cows. That person's only symptom was eye redness and inflammation, or conjunctivitis, so not a full-blown respiratory infection, and they seem to have recovered fully. It was only the second time a person in the U.S. has been infected with this virus. The first was in 2022 in Colorado, and someone who had had contact with infected poultry. So in both of those cases, the person was infected by direct close contact with an animal, right? That's right. It doesn't appear to spread easily between people. But that doesn't mean we should be nonchalant about it. It's definitely worrisome that it's infecting so many mammals, including cows. Cows make milk, which we drink. Is there a risk of people getting sick from milk from infected cows? It's possible, but unlikely if the milk has been pasteurized. We don't really know if it can be transmitted via raw milk, but you should always drink pasteurized milk in general because that kills harmful pathogens, including bird flu, experts think. Raw milk is actually banned by the FDA. I mean, big brands sold nationally. But you can find some at farmers markets or other local stores, and that's where I'd be careful. Before I start panicking about another killer virus, at this moment, Tanya, how big of a danger is bird flu to humans? Well, the CDC and World Health Organization both say that the threat to humans remains low for now. I talked to Michael Osterholm, director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, to get his take. He's been involved in assessing potential pandemic pathogen risk for decades. The risk assessment from both WHO and CDC remains low risk for humans with this virus, and I support that. If you look at the cases that have occurred since 1997, when it really first emerged in human cases in Hong Kong through mid-2015 to 16. Those years were by far the highest risk situation. We've seen very few cases in humans since then. That's interesting, but couldn't the virus easily mutate into something more worrisome? That's what Christine was saying earlier. And that's how the virus that causes COVID got going. If this one did get going, how would we know when to worry? That's a great point. Yes, the biggest concern with avian flu is that it could mutate to start infecting humans more easily. But historically, most of the cases in humans have come from close contact with infected animals, not from human-to-human transmission. That said, the more this virus spreads in animals, the more opportunities it has to evolve into something that's more efficient at infecting humans. The virus has changed. It's mutated to the point of where it is infecting other mammal species and birds at an increasing rate. But we've had no evidence yet that that's happened for humans or for pigs. And pigs would be the animal species that, to me, would be the sentinel that I'd be most concerned about. Why are pigs such a big deal? Well, pigs can harbor both swine and human viruses. In the animals, the viruses can swap components, and a pig virus can gain features that make it easier to infect people. Okay, got it. So if H5N1 starts showing up in pigs, we should be a little worried. Yeah, that's definitely something scientists will be on the lookout for. The viral sequence from the recent human case did have a mutation that allows it to spread more efficiently in mammals, but it lacked a key mutation that would enable it to infect the human respiratory tract more easily. If the virus does evolve to spread more easily from person to person, we do at least have vaccines and antiviral medication for flu. 
It's not clear how protective the seasonal flu vaccine would be, but there is a small amount of H5N1 vaccine stockpiled. I guess that news helps me sleep a little easier, but just a little, because I wonder if bird flu or any other virus were to cause another pandemic, are we better prepared for it now than we were when COVID hit? That is the billion dollar question, right? In some ways we are, and in some ways we aren't. I think we still have a lot of growth to do in terms of how we can prepare and head off things. But I'm really, as always, impressed by our colleagues in the government who work incredibly hard to keep an eye on these things. It all comes back to the idea of One Health. We need to monitor not just the health of humans, but also that of other animals and the environment. Bird flu may not be an immediate threat to humans now, but we shouldn't get too complacent. At this point, again, the virus as it is, uh, I don't believe, poses a major risk to humans. But that could change overnight. Your Health Quickly is produced by Corinne Leong, Madison Goldberg, Jeff Del Vicio, and by us. It's edited by Ella Fetter and Alexa Lim. Our music is composed by Dominic Smith. Our show is part of Scientific American's podcast, Science Quickly. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, give us a rating or a review. And if you have a topic you want us to cover, you can email us at yourhealthquickly at siam.com. That's yourhealthquickly at siam.com. For Your Health Quickly, I'm Tanya Lewis. And I'm Josh Fishman. See you next time. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. We continue our series on dark money today, focusing on limited liability corporations, or LLCs, commonly used for organizing small businesses. But LLCs can also be used to hide political donations from the public. In most states, other than the original corporate registration, LLCs are not required to disclose their member shareholders. The IRS treats LLCs as a partnership. So for a federal candidate campaign donation, each shareholder of the LLC must account for it in their $3,300 maximum contribution. Instead, in federal races, LLCs are more often used to funnel money to super PACs, where only the LLC's name needs to be reported. There, the money can get bundled to buy negative ads or other activities in support of a campaign. For state races in over half of the country, LLCs can make contributions directly to candidates. In some states, this means unlimited contributions, and in others, the individual limit with no requirement to disclose shareholders. LLCs can also contribute to PACs, super PACs, and dark money groups. So in most states, LLCs are used so voters won't really know who's behind the money influencing their elections. A few states, like Arizona and New York, are attempting to force LLCs to disclose their members' donations trying to close what's called the LLC loophole. More on that in our next report. We have detailed explainers and resources at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1952. That was the day 100,000 oil refinery workers went out on strike. The work stoppage was called by a coalition of 22 unions, including AFL and CIO affiliates and independent unions. They demanded a 25 cent hourly wage increase with shift differentials. Shutdowns began at once and picket lines were up as soon as procedures were safely completed. The strike threatened to cut production in half. Union leaders called all but the California refinery workers out who were central to the war effort in Korea. Oil barons had given refinery workers the runaround for eight months during contract negotiations. The union had even postponed the original strike date in March to give federal mediation a chance in effecting a settlement. When this failed, President Harry Truman brought the case to the Wage Stabilization Board, which issued a ruling favorable to the industry. 80 companies demanded separate hearings for all 200 bargaining units involved. The union wanted one hearing for all. Even after this victory for the oil companies, they then refused to attend the hearings. When the board threw up its hands in mid-April, the new strike deadline was set. Eight days into the strike, the board ordered oil workers back to work, which they flat out refused. The oil workers union stated, quote, strikers are fighting against a stacked deck. If corporation executives are permitted to ignore workers' needs, then to manipulate the government so the right to strike is denied, collective bargaining will be destroyed. 
The board then set a 15 cent an hour wage cap and shift differentials. Workers were back on the job by the end of the month, having avoided possible Taft-Hartley actions from President Truman. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 42 degrees Fahrenheit, mostly cloudy conditions currently. Looks like we'll have sun and clouds mixed a little bit later and throughout the day. Highs in the low to mid 60s, winds out of the west northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Then a few passing clouds tonight with lows around 40. Winds out of the north northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Then sunny tomorrow along with a few clouds. Highs near 70. Winds out of the north at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then it looks like uh, rain will be accumulating overnight tomorrow night. And beginning Thursday uh, should have uh, rain through the weekend and beyond with each day having quite a bit of rain forecast. So we look forward to that because, hey, the gardens, the deep rooted trees, they like it. And so do we. Grass pollen is rated high in our little town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 19 parts per million, which means that people are going to burn their trash to stink up the air because who likes good, clean air? Who does? Hey, that daytime UV index is high at level 7. If you have similar numbers, do take care. Barometric pressure is falling. At 30.24 inches, visibility is at 9 miles, and relative humidity is at 88%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the Weather Underground. The little weather station pretty near the city center of London is registering 65 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 66 and mostly cloudy with a thunderstorm advisory, which means look out. I got to tell you, thunderstorms that roll through Paris are damn scary. Loud, too. Rome is 78 degrees and sunny with a wind advisory. Kabul is 46 and clear with a (laughs) Taliban advisory. Look out for them. Uh, Hong Kong is 62 degrees and cloudy with an anti-democratic policy enveloping the island. So I'd take care as well. Tokyo is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. I got no political news on them. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 52 degrees, partly cloudy with a sheep graziers advisory, meaning heavy winds. Low to uh, very, very low and cold temperatures and rain. So take care of your sheep. San Francisco, California is 53 degrees and sunny. Chicago, Illinois is 60 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 58 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world.
Yaris Karamanu of the Associated Press World Desk brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Belarusian authorities yesterday Monday declared that the Belarusian service of the German state broadcaster Deutsche Welle is an extremist organization and banned all its activities in the country. The declaration means anyone working with Deutsche Welle producing content for the Belarusian service potentially faces a seven-year prison sentence. Anyone who reads and reports articles by Deutsche Welle could be found guilty of an administrative or criminal offense. Peter Limburg, Deutsche Welle's director general, criticized the decision, saying the accusations are unfounded and do not reflect the true nature of the Belarusian service's work. Belarusian authorities have already named 199 organizations as extremists, and they use the label to suppress dissent in the country. The list includes the Belarusian service of Radio Free Europe, Free Radio Liberty, and the independent Belarusian TV channel Belsat, broadcasting in the Belarusian language from the Polish capital of Warsaw. The situation with freedom of speech in Del- Belarus is the worst in Europe, said Andre Bastunets the head of the Belarusian Association of Journalists, adding that Belarus was akin to European North Korea. Well, them's fatten words. Belarus was rocked by mass protests in 2020 after the country's authoritarian president, Alexander Lukashenko, declared he had won a sixth term in office. The vote was condemned by the West and the opposition as fraudulent. So, in response, human rights organizations said authorities have arrested more than 35,000 people, brutally beating some of them. Many prominent opposition figures were arrested and sentenced to long prison terms while others fled abroad. Deutsche Welle's Belarusian service is based in Bonn, and the news organization is financed by the German government. According to the Belarusian Association of Journalists, there are currently 36 journalists behind bars in Belarus. Considering what Belarus has done, this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays is brought by the staff of Deutsche Welle. A member of Germany's Bundeswehr went on trial in the western city of Dusseldorf yesterday, Monday, charged with espionage activities on behalf of Russia and leaking state secrets. At the start of the trial, the defendant admitted that he spied for Russia. He said his actions were driven by fear of a nuclear escalation amid Russia's war in Ukraine. Sure! The officer was arrested on August 9th of last year, and the charges against him were made public on March 19th. The defendant is accused of making repeated and unsolicited offers to cooperate starting in May of 2023 at both Russia's consulate in Bonn and its embassy embassy in Berlin. 
He already provided some sensitive information during those meetings. According to prosecutors, he also photographed old training documents related to munition systems and aircraft technology and dropped the material into the letterbox of the Russian consulate in Bonn. The prosecutors say there is no evidence of him receiving payment. Oh, is that nice. The 54-year-old man said that the accusations against him were broadly accurate. The officer added that he regretted his actions and that he was in a bad mental state at the time. Yeah, no kidding. Around the same time as his cooperation with Russian authorities, he had also applied for membership with the AFD. The court said his application was authorized in July of 2023. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here on Wednesday, tomorrow Wednesday, for Smothered Benedict Wednesday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speaking. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver